I am pulling out the earpiece. We just finished wrapping with Josh Linville, uh, recording him discuss fertilizer. He's the director of fertilizer for the Stonex company. Arlen Suderman also is uh, an employee of Stonex that appears on the Market to Market TV show from time to time. So we do kind of start a little bit in, in the area of the connection between the two of them. What we're going to talk today is about the fertilizer industry. We're going to have a big umbrella first, and then we're going to quickly go into a cup, follow a couple of raindrops down when it comes to nitrogen and urea and phosphorus. But again, it's a big macro look at the industry, some of the global issues. It's going to be fast moving in a couple of times where you may have to rewind and go, wait, what? Uh, we'll try to help you out there as best we can. And I play the duh, Paul card which I think maybe I'll change the name of this podcast. If you, oh, by the way, I'm Paul Yeager and the host of this MTOM show podcast, new episodes each and every Tuesday. If you have feedback for me or a guest idea, send me an email at paul.yeager, Y-E-A-G-E-R at iowapbs.org. Let's get into fertilizer now as we talk about some of the news of the day, the barge story, the global story, demand, just cut our demand. It's that simple, right? Maybe some genetics, lots to get to. Here's Josh Linden. So when we have Arlen on, I have to hear, and we have to talk, I have to bone up on Kansas State. So for you, I have to bone up on Mizzou. How's the SEC treating you? Well, it's uh, very good because there's a lot of comparisons with a very educational type school in Vanderbilt. Unfortunately, they're not making the comparisons from an education standpoint. They're making it from a sports comparison. So maybe not the best case scenario today, but it's at least something. <laughs> well, yeah. And Mizzou is a great school. Uh, in fact, I, my son just, we toured there this summer and I've got lots of friends in journalism that have gone through there. Uh, you, what's the trip from St. Joe to Columbia? How far of a venture out was that for you as a kid? Uh, from home is about two and a half hours each way. Uh, yeah. got to know I-70 very, very well, but, uh, yeah, I had time in my life. I love the school, love the campus, love the people. It was trying to get both of my boys to go there partly because I like the school and partly because of in-state tuition. That's a that, big part of it. That helps too. Trust me. <laughs> we're aware that we'd be out of state tuition. How yes. did you end up from, uh, why, why go to college? What was the vision that you had when you left the farm? Oh, um, actually my uncle. Um, he was the first person in our family to have gone to college. He ended up being a, uh, naval helicopter pilot and grew up around him, kind of idolizing him and figured he went to Mizzou. Darn it. I need to go to Mizzou as well. So you were thinking, but what, were you thinking agriculture the whole time? No, uh, I actually went to school with every intention of getting away from agriculture. Um, I went to the business school. I got a degree in finance and banking as well as real estate. <clears throat> the idea was, you know, go do the whole Wall Street thing, go do the hedge fund thing, make a lot of money, and then you start getting really heavy into real estate. And one of the jobs I got offered was in a, a company called DeBruce, based out of Kansas City. Um, they had been looking in the wintertime for somebody to go on the grain side. Of course, they needed somebody right then. I didn't graduate until spring. And later on, a couple of months later, they came back and said, hey, if you still like the company, you still like us, we got a position on the fertilizer side. So I took that, loved the people I was talking to, and the rest is history. Agriculture has a way of sucking us back in. Every time you try and get away, it pulls you back. Well, and I've told this story a time or two. My, my father basically told me there's just no place for you on this farm, and it wasn't a great time in the 80s, early 90s. Um, we weren't going to expand, at least in the current setting. And yep. Here I am talking agriculture all the time. Uh, it's kind of funny how life does work, Josh. So fertilizer, you kind of back into it, and now you are head into it. What drives you to get up in the morning to, to dive into such a topic as fertilizer? Because it's insanely important. And it's one of those markets very, very few people know about. It. It's and actually, it's funny, the first several years of my uh, life in this career, my coworkers, friends, and I, we always used to joke, how can we term our job if we're at the bar talking to somebody so we don't have to bring up that we work in fertilizer? We come up with these <laughs> commodity trader and a logistics specialist. We didn't want to talk about what we actually did. Well, now all of a sudden, I, I really think that I stayed into it because you look at fertilizer. It is talked about around the world. All of a sudden, the world has woken up to not just how important agriculture is, but how important fertilizer is. And you've got countries that are playing politics with it. You have got major losses of production around the world. It's, while it is extremely price volatile 
and just day to day, it's stressful. I mean, the last two years, I've not had a day off, but it's exciting. There's always something changing and trying to figure out what's the next shoe to drop. What's the next thing that's going to change out here? It's a, it's a market that's seen more volatility than most any other commodity out there. And was that volatility mostly in the last two years, or do you always feel that there's been volatility? We just didn't notice it. There has always been, there's always been volatility, but the price changes haven't been near as extreme of what they've been here recently. It used to be if we had a price change in a given day, 10 to $20 a ton, for example, that was a major event. And you talked about the rest of the week. Now, if we have a price that changes $10 a ton, it's not even worth talking about. That's a very minor event. We've had days where this price has moved triple digits. And I know there's a lot of people out there that talk about it and say, well, you know, this is not okay and it shouldn't be doing this. I understand where they're coming from. It doesn't feel right. But when you look at the events that are going on around the world, you know, Europe from a nitrogen standpoint, they, most of their production is turned off. Um, our friends at ICIS are sitting there saying they think operating rates are 30% of normal. Well, they represent 5% of all the global urea produced. They represent 8% of the global anhydrous. 21% of the UAN comes from Western and Central Europe. That's huge losses. Chinese government's banning the export of urea. They represent 10% of the global export, about five and a half million tons exported per year. So these government political things, and in fact, you even see Russia playing some politics with their fertilizer exports with Brazil and India and places like this. It has become something where the price volatility, the massive price swings we see are justified because they are major market changing events. Just before we get, came together, I was just working on a script for the show this week, and we were discussing something about, well, that's 5.5%. Well, that's a significant – in whatever it is, 5.5 to 10, when you're talking 10 like China and urea, yes, that's a major thing. Is that yeah. why – okay, let me back up. Is that why fertilizer has been such – a volatile thing is because of all these factors blended up together. There isn't one leader of all of these little 10 percents. Yeah. Um, my presentation, I go around the U S around the world using, I always start with the exact same thing. I have got two slides to go through all of the events, all the black swan events that have happened since summer of 2020 when all this started. And I tried to explain to the audience, this isn't just one event. This is not just two events. This has been one after another, after another. And somebody said earlier today, you keep talking about these black swan events, you need to make the pin a little bit bigger because you're getting a lot of them. And they're right. I'm about ready to add a third slide to it. Um, so all these things are going on. And you're right. A lot of times we like to discount. Well, OK, so we lost European production. It's only 5%. And you're right. 5% isn't an enormous number. There's over 225 million tons of urea produced per year. 5% of 225 million tons is a very, very big number. Small moves do not mean small tonnage. Small moves don't mean small tonnage. Got it. Okay. So then the question that I get asked then, like when you say something like you just did is, well, then why do we need global production? Why do we, why can't we do things domestically here? Why can't we do it in the United States? Well, and we do to a certain extent, we do produce quite a bit here in the U S. Um, but unfortunately, when you start looking forward, it's a very difficult process. Let's focus on, because when you talk about phosphate and potash, you've got to find phosphate and potash reserves in the ground. And if you can find enough reserves in the spot that you can build production, well, now you have to get environmental government approvals. Not exactly an easy thing. You know, Florida phosphate, for example, they my, Mosaic could expand their mines, expand their production, but the Florida economy runs on tourism dollars, not on phosphate production. And the environmentalists don't want it because it's a bad thing for Mother Earth. So it's a very difficult thing to do. Nitrogen, same thing. If you can come up with, you know, to build a new world scale uh, uh, plant brand new, you need somewhere between five and six billion US dollars. If you can come up with that, now you're talking about a plant that will be operational for the next 20, 30, 40, 50 years. Are you confident that U.S. natural gas prices are not going to skyrocket? Our administration changes every four to eight years. Our focus seems to change every two years. So it's very hard to sit there and look at that and say, I have enough confidence. I'm going to go invest $5 billion on a market that we have no idea what happens. Well, it's the same as the crude oil market. There's no yeah. been no new refinery in, what, 50 years in the United States? Right. So, yeah. I mean, it's the same because it's that same argument. Mm -hmm. Who is going to stick their neck out for it? Right. Uh, okay. And I guess I should even back up further. When we say fertilizer, it does mean like 12 different things. 
Yeah. Yeah. I mean, we you, foc- you've mentioned we like eight on- of them already. And I, <laughs> <laughs> now we focus on the majors. We focus on nitrogen, phosphate, and potash. And your audience is going to sit there and say, well, what about gypsum? What about lime? What about zinc? What about magnesium? All these other things. Those are more specialized products. They do not act as a commodity because they are in the whole scheme of things. They are relatively small. However, we focus on the majors. On nitrogen, we focus on urea, UA, and anhydrous. We focus on DAP and MAP for phosphate and, of course, potash. Because those are the ones that act more like a commodity. Those are the ones that see more price volatility. And those are the ones that matter. I'm not. I'm, I'm sorry, not matter. Those are the ones used on a much more daily, regular basis on the average U.S. farm. Absolutely. And when you look at a, a farmer input program, the nitrogen, the phosphate, and the potash accounts for so much of that pie. The, those minor products, while they're absolutely needed to maximize your crops and everything, I'm not trying to sit there and say, but when you look at it from a cost perspective, it's relatively minor. I had someone ask me, well, let they asked a little bit of your background, and they're like, well, does he sell it? And I go, no, he analyzes it. Mm-hmm. So, so from this sense, you're protected in this question. Uh, what <laughs> happens if we just use less of it? Well, then markets go down. Uh, Right now, we're already using our Fertilizer 23 demand models. Our fertilizer year starts July 1, it goes through June 30. So we're already looking to next year, and we're looking at using 93 million acres of corn here in the U.S., 88 beans, 49 and a half wheat, and then a whole litany of other crops out there. And that builds into a total final number. So we sit there and we look at it. If we hit our demand model, the market should stay relatively flat. There's a lot of people saying this corn crop is worse than what we think it's going to be. We just don't have the data yet. Well, if it is worse, guess what? Corn acres need to rise. Guess what rises with corn acres? Demand for fertilizers. So from a nitrogen, there's a very direct correlation. Acres go up, demand goes up. Phosphate and potash is one that the farmers can look at cutting their rates. That's one of the first things they look at to save money. And let's face it, if you haven't been having a conversation with your banker, I'd suggest having that conversation. Next year's crop is going to be expensive. One of the first things to look at is phosphate potash. We saw it last year. People are trying to say, well, they can't do it two years in a row. I'm pretty sure in our operation, my dad's operation, it's a corn bean rotation. The crop that was last year corn that we reduced on, this year's bean, we don't have to worry. Last year's bean is this year's corn, and we can mine that soil. So there is a little bit more of a flexibility on that demand, but nitrogen is a little bit more uh, straightforward. So the natural, I mean, and, and maybe it's where I come from and, and what's around me, but uh, yes, that crop rotation is almost like a no brainer for some, but, yeah. but others don't do that. It's corn on right. corn on corn, yep. but that alternation of corn beans, there's natural things put into the bean that again, yes. I'm speaking, many people know, and they're like, duh, Paul, right. duh. but there's some that, that, that's a, To me, what you just said is like, oh, duh, Paul. That's that I could easily just call this duh, Paul. That should be the name of this podcast. We'll call it that way. And you're right. And again, if we were to sit there and talk about what what percentage of the corn acres out there are corn on corn on corn, we would sit there and we'd go back and we'd say, well, it's a relatively small percentage. Well, what's our next thing we need to say? How big is the overall number? That number isn't overly small. So you're right. It's still something, even though it's something the entire audience is sitting there saying, well, duh, we understand that. It's still something we need right. to keep, keep in the conversation. Okay, well, then let me go this way. Uh, the big seed companies, they have already altered genetics to be better at handling drought resistant or, or they become more drought resistant. They can handle dry or wet conditions all in the same seed. Do you think it's possible to work genetics that may not need the fertilizer as much or can just take a small amount and make it work? Right. Yeah, that's obviously, that's the uh, the golden goose out there, right? That's what every farmer in the world wants. The problem even with that, though, if they come up with those genetics, chances are they're going to sit there and say, oh, they don't need all this fertilizer. Our seed needs to be typical seed cost plus all this fertilizer. We want it all. You know, we've developed yeah. this technology. We want all this stuff. But no, I mean, I know that's something that everybody's working into. Um, I know there's some new de- technologies with the, uh, the bio and the soil that releases more of the nutrients and things like that. And I, I think it's interesting, but all of this stuff are things that when we look longer term, look, you know, two, three, five, 10 years down the road, we need to in the back of our mind say, hey, some of these, one of these might actually catch one of these days. But it's also a new technology that to me is not proven yet because we haven't seen it on a wide scale. So I'm not willing to change any of my models or my outlooks based on a technology that might or might not work. We've seen a lot of, I don't want to say snake oil sold to the industry. There's been a lot of hopeful things that petered out and didn't happen. 
we've got to do the same thing with seed technology, with fertilizer, uh, different approaches, things like that. But that's one of those topics that you have to look at that yeah. maybe goes into one more X factor on your balance sheet that you, or your Excel spreadsheet when you're figuring out things. Yes, yeah. absolutely. Okay, it's one of those risk things that you put out there. All right, risk. Let's talk about that. If uh, what happens if a fertilizer price is so high for a producer? Does that at some point just you mentioned the banker out of a dollars and cents mm -hmm. issue? Does that just force the issue of, well, we're just not going to use as much, therefore the demand isn't there? Does the price drop? It could. Um, it's certainly something we are watching. Um, you know, you could see it correct itself from a demand standpoint, because yeah, the further your price goes up, and right now, take UAN and Urea, for example, there is a very, very wide price spread between those two. UAN is a very big premium. That makes sense because Europe's offline, yeah, they're 5% of the world uh, urea, but they're 21% of UAN. UAN should be a premium. That is the market's way of trying to force the farmer to give up on UAN and go to urea, which is more plentiful. Um, but overall, we think that the nitrogen needs to be there, right? You've got to have nitrogen to grow the crop. Phosphate and potash is a lot more flexible. That Those numbers can go down. We do already anticipate both of those application rates will be down next year. That will continue to weigh on price ideas. but Nitrogen, unless we start cutting the acres next year, will, looks very, very difficult to do with the harvest, the way it's going, the information we're getting. That the only way in my mind right now that we see nitrogen prices fall substantially is if Europe turns back on. And if somebody can give me an idea of how Russian European politics are going to play out over the next six months, let me know. I've got a job for you. <laughs> we're going to call this fertilizer market perfectly. <laughs> well, okay. When, when you say Europe, the switch goes back on, where are we watching? Is, is it just Russia, Ukraine? Well, it is, uh, it's more natural gas prices in Europe because that's the feedstock for this nitrogen uh, production system. Normally natural gas prices over there. And I watch the Dutch TTF that does not set the price for all of Europe, but it's the best one to watch. It's the easiest one to watch. Normally it's in that five, six, seven dollars in the MBTU range. Fertilizer production was 100% or close to. It rallied to as much as $100 in MMBTU. All but 30% of Europe had turned off on a nitrogen standpoint. Now, those prices have since fallen to around 50. That's where the number has been floating, you know, 48 to $52 in MMBTU. But if that value continues to fall down to a point where manufacturers can say, I can start making money again, then they start the restart process. And if you start to restart that, now, all those tons that are offline that have helped support price ideas around the world, now you start to see them come off because you've lost that European demand and you've gained that supply. Okay. Uh, put the demand side equation for the Europeans. I want to go back to the supply part. Is there anybody that can add into that supply around the world that was produced by Russia or Ukraine? That We're could... Talk I'm talking... Go ahead. On the natural gas side? Yeah. You do see tons that are flowing in there. You know, the U.S. has been a big exporter over there. Uh, some other countries are doing the same thing. The problem is, I understand, listen, I am not a natural gas guy. I right. barely understand fertilizer half the days. But as I've been told, there are logistical constraints on moving product of natural gas moving into Europe. The, the system just isn't designed. That's why the pipeline was there. It, it's the same thing where if the entirety of the U.S. had to switch to truck all of a sudden to move all of our material, if rail and uh, barge shut off, it's not happening. It's the same thing with Europe. There's only so much that can be done, and that's the problem. We can't completely offset what Russia used to flow through that Nord Stream pipeline. And after those uh, charges went off on the pipeline last week, that looked any sort of a chance we had is even lower now. Interesting. Any okay? Uh, when you you mentioned um, the barge situation, I just saw you tweet before we came on another Black yeah. Swan event possibly forming when it comes to <laughs> moving fertilizers up and down the Mississippi River. Again, our logistical supply chain infrastructure comes under uh, something we didn't expect, but we kind of knew was maybe coming. It's been dry in certain yeah. areas, and there's no water in the Mississippi, as mm -hmm. there should be for this time of year. What's that mean? What's that matter? Well, yeah, it's another one of those events we had been watching, but I didn't want to sit there and talk about it because I'm so tired of just bad news after bad news. After a while, you're like, okay, you know what? Just prove it to me. I'm a Missouri guy. Show me. 
show me the problem. <laughs> the problem is it showed us. Uh, yeah, we had a, a barge line part claim force majeure. They are uh, canceling shipments because low water means uh, lighter barge loads, fewer barges per tow, uh, reduced uh, travel times. You heard barges are hitting ground around Memphis. And the problem for that is, and the reason why this is so, so big, and this is not just a fertilizer issue, this is also a grain issue. Our river systems are the arteries of our transportation from an agricultural standpoint. And if barge were to shut down, and the problem is, this is not a Arkansas River and Upper Mississippi and Ohio, or any of this stuff. It is lower miss. Everything through the Gulf of Mexico travels through that corridor. If that corridor shuts down or is greatly reduced, it affects everything throughout the Midwest, mountain range to mountain range. Because then we have to start trying to put stuff on truck and we don't have enough truck right. drivers and trucks yeah. and we, it slows it down and not everything can yeah. go over the, 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 the ground like that. Absolutely. You, you're, you go down to two options, right? There's three, uh, there's three legs to the stool. There's barge, there's rail, and there's truck. Take out barge. Now you go to rail. That's your next most efficient route. Well, anybody who receives rail will tell you it's, it's slow. It takes time to get there. And I'm not digging on you know railroad workers or anything like that. It's just a slower transport. And then you go to trucks. We have lost so many over-the-road hopper truckers to places like Amazon and things like that that I don't think a lot of people understand it. Uh, when I started in this industry, there were tons of them all around. That's not the case anymore. They can go work for Amazon, run all day, and be home with their family, not driving a 10 buck two to grab a load of fertilizer at a terminal that may not load you if you're three minutes after 5 o'clock. So we've lost a lot of them. That our system is not designed to lose barge. It simply is not. And you you mentioned the truck story about uh, it changing an industry. Yeah, the trucking over the road trucking industry is a tough industry for someone trying mm -hmm. to uh, be in in a family or have a life that is more eight to five. And we know yeah. that not every job can be that way. It's just some people have realized I don't want to be that way. Yeah. And that's just what that's the realities of the world right now. Right. What we need is uh, what was the old uh, the trucker movie with like Burt Reynolds and those guys? Mm -hmm. What was that movie? It got smoking the like, bandit, baby. Smoking the bandit. We need another smoking Jerry the Reed to get all the younger people excited about trucking over the road and all the adventures you can have. That's what we need to get an influx of new over the road guys. Yes, the new the new a relaunch to put Eastbound and Down back in all the TV commercials. I'm like, what's this from? This is kind of cool. Yeah. Then they'll discover. Yeah, we're doing movie. it with every other movie out there. Why can't we redo that movie? That's right. That is right. <laughs> uh, when you look at you, you said you're going to have to add a third slide for Black Swan events. At what point do we become numb to all of these events and the market might not react and we go back to $10 a ton is news? Unfortunately, I don't think anytime soon. Um, you might become numb to it, but unfortunately, it is still a huge fundamental shift that has to move price. Uh, a lot of these things we always try and look at it is fertilizer moving from an emotional point of view or is it moving from a fundamental point of view? And if you can figure that out, you've got you've got one about 75% of your battles. But when we see these events happen, you can sit there and say, oh yeah, sure, Mississippi River shut down. That just makes sense, whatever. And you go on about your merry day, it still changes the fundamentals of the marketplace. So unfortunately, I don't foresee that um, as we look forward over the next several years on like the nitrogen globally. Like I said, multi-billion dollars. And then you got to build it, you got to get it operational. This takes years to do from start to finish. We have a very good idea of what's coming online between now and 2025. We also have an idea about overall global nitrogen demand. Global demand grows faster than our new capacity coming online. So this thing gets tighter as we move forward. That means as these events happen, the volatility, the price movement that we will see is going to be even greater than what we've been dealing with. I, I, I hate to say it from a nitrogen perspective, volatility is not going anywhere. And I don't think it improves. I don't think it gets easier in the short term. Well, you sound like the grain guys and gals that come on the show now. That's the, some of the same things you, they've been saying. I was going to say, and late last week, I did a presentation. I said, I feel bad. I'm going to start in my contracts. I'm going to start putting a, a kicker in there. That says every single person that walks in the room to listen to me gets a shot of whiskey before they sit down. <laughs> uh, when you're sitting at the bar ordering a shot of whiskey for somebody and it's a bar where everybody kind of knows what you do, how do you describe what it is that you do? It's uh, try to break down and educate the market on fertilizer moves. This fertilizer market is one that isn't real giving with its information. Uh, information is very closely guarded. Uh, the information that is given out is usually done strategically. 
And that's why whenever I start these presentations, I start every single one of them the same. And I'll do one this evening to a Chile group. I'll do the exact same thing to those guys. I have a zero physical position on fertilizer. We don't touch it. I have a zero position on paper. We do not hold a longer or short. I won't allow myself to trade fertilizer socks because I want to remain as unbiased as possible so that the information we are giving, I am giving, we are giving to the marketplace is as unbiased. Now, that doesn't mean we're always right. I wish we were. I'd be doing a different job if that was the case. I'd be lo- having a different house. You'd be looking at the ocean in the back. I was going to say, and I don't think yeah. I would get you to uh, talk. It'd be a pretty expensive get. Yeah, I, I'd probably do this as a hobby still, but you'd have a different background. <laughs> but no, it's but it's again trying to give information as unbiased as we can. We try to educate the market on how to on what to look for, what are the things to look at, what do, what should you be expecting coming forward? Because the more information we have, the better informed, the better decision we can make, and ultimately, hopefully, that works out to saving some dollars here and there, or at least locking up an opportunity to buy fertilizer, sell grain, and secure profits that way. I just had a question last week on the show, and I'm you just said something that prompted it. Somebody had said they had sold 23 corn and also bought some fertilizer for 23 July, or kind of to hedge themselves. I mean, are you hearing that that's happening more and more? I think more and more people are doing it. That's something we have been preaching since I came on to Stone X. Um, farmers, when I grew up in the industry, I used to ask my dad, why aren't you selling your grain ahead? Why aren't you doing this? Why aren't you doing that? And I never understood why as a farmer and I'm not, the audience is probably going to say, Linville, how dare you say this? Work with me. Give me a second here. But when I look at farming, all I see is a manufacturer, no more, no less. And of course you're so much bigger than what that is. But what I mean by that is that every manufacturer out there, they look at what's the cost of my inputs and what can I sell my outputs and what's that ratio? What's that profit? Farmers are doing the same thing. You are buying in your inputs and you are producing your output, your grain. So rather than getting fixated on flat price and this and that, I get it. If you can buy the low of the fertilizer and sell the high of the grain, fantastic. Same thing. I got a job waiting for it. You can do that all the time. But a lot of us can't. So we look at this opportunity. If we only lock in the fertilizer, that's speculation because what happens if that grain goes down? And what if we only sell the grain and the fertilizer goes up? Both sides of that is more of a hedge than anything else. And that's why we look at it from that perspective. How many bushels of corn, beans, wheat, milo, canola, whatever it might be, are we spending to buy that exact same ton? And everybody you ask, would you rather spend more or less bushels? You'd rather spend less. Right. Okay. Uh, Josh, when you uh, go on to Twitter, mm-hmm. you have a pretty good presence. Um, lots of people you follow. Mm-hmm. What are you looking for to gather from that source and disseminate? Right now, I am looking for kind of ideas on what the harvest looks like. Is it good? Is it bad? And we always have to overlay it a little bit of like, you don't always go in there and just say, oh, it's a so-so. It's average. Usually it's like, oh my gosh, it's the end of the world. Oh my gosh, it's the best I've ever had. So you've got to kind of disseminate through that, but you look for little keys there. But really trying to figure out, you know, look for some of these pieces overseas, for example. There's a lot of people who got a lot of good information. Hey, I heard this about uh, Russia. There's an uprising happening and Putin's seat is getting very, very hot and that could change things if he's replaced with somebody Western friendly. Well, if that happens, guess what happens with Europe? Everything starts to come back to closer to normal. So we look for those sorts of events. We look for, you know, the Pakistan flooding that occurred this summer. Um, they're one of the bigger buyers. They're one of the top 10 buyers of fertilizer around the world. That meant their demand went next to nothing. Mm-hmm. That's something that helped out uh, phosphate and potash values continue to fall. So just looking for little market pieces out there that might not get picked up by the major publications and just trying to overlay that with our point of view to either back that or change it. Yeah. Never a dull moment. No, there's not. It's uh, like I said yesterday, the day, the day started very early. It didn't end until about 10 o'clock last night. And uh, yeah, I sat there and swore I wasn't going to get into farming and I'm basically doing farming hours. <laughs> <laughs> And, but you're not getting outside. That's the problem. That's right. <laughs> you know, I guess it's nice when it's a bad w- rainy day, but you don't get those rainy days in yeah. trading like you do uh, when you're combining and it rain, you know, rains half an inch. So, all right, right, Josh Linville, I appreciate the time and the insight. Thank you so much. I know you're a busy guy and uh, just always helpful to uh, get a little insight on what goes on in another yeah. part of farming. Absolutely. Appreciate you having me on. My thanks to Josh Linville for his time. If you have feedback for the podcast, market to market at iowapbs.org or just a story topic you want to hear about in general, 
That's where you send an email, market to market at iowapbs.org. New episodes come out each and every Tuesday. We'll see you next time here on the MTOM Show podcast, a production of Iowa PBS.